Let me hear your report. Okay. Abraham Lincoln was born in a log cabin in Illinois. This poor white trash went on to become the president of the United States. What then off is this white capitalist one? Swine! Manipulated the freedom of the black man for his own political career. Free brother! Do you know the piece of poor white trash? Shot him in the head. The end. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Peace, peace, peace. I am Philip Roundtree, and you are tuned into the June 8th edition of, rhetorically speaking, props to those of you who are tuned in on Facebook Live on, on both pages, on my personal page and on my public page. And of course, shout out to those of you who are watching on YouTube Live. Listen, we have a dope show on tap for you today. I'm going to get to the introduction first. I want to address that video that I just played, right? Because you might be saying, who was that guy? Who was that white little boy <laughs> and, and what was all that going on that was my introduction to clarence williams the third that was from one of one of the greatest negro movies of all time i'm going to get you sucker i thought that scene was hilarious uh over the weekend clarence williams the third became an ancestor he transitioned um again that was my introduction to him but apparently he was in a TV show called Mod Squad and he, and he was Link. I also know him from Tales from the Hood and, and just so many uh, amazing roles that he's played throughout his, his life. And, you know, we got to show love to black folk who transition and become an ancestor. And so, listen, rest in power to Clarence Williams III. So as I said, listen, we have a dope show on tap. And this is all brought to you by Philodenko, who is having an amazing, amazing, amazing virtual online auction taking place on June 27th. You're going to see so many amazing artists. Listen, I have one here. I, I've viewed his work for the first time over the weekend, and I'm just like, where have I been? Maybe I've been like... You know, underneath, well, I know where I've been. I've been in this, these doctoral books. <laughs> right? I've been doing this, this doctoral study thing. And so, yeah, I've, I've clearly, I've been in a rock. But we have Mr. John Dow here. But there's also going to be amazing people like Terrence Gore, who was on with me last week. We have Gail Lloyd, Angela Davis Johnson, and more. So it's an amazing, amazing event out for us, by us. So participate, because we know we got to support one another. We can't rely on them. We can't rely on others to keep these type of traditions uh, like Philodenko going. And so you can get your, your tickets at www.philodenko.org. Listen, I'm excited. This is the, the second consecutive week that I'm interviewing somebody with the Wikipedia page. And so that means that the brother is special. <laughs> that means that if you have a Wikipedia page, that because usually you don't create that on your own, right? That means somebody thinks enough of you and the work that you do to create one for you. Now, yes, there may be some fictional things like, I don't know, it might say he related to Martin Luther King. It might say that on the Wikipedia page. But the mere fact that he has one is a beautiful thing. So tonight I am privileged to be joined by artist, photographer, Professor Emeritus of Printmaking at the Tyler School of Art at Temple University and Philly native John Dow. Listen, and that's, I don't want you to speak yet, Mr. Dow, not yet, because I still got to reel off some of your accomplishments right quick. Listen, his work is in over 70 museums and public collections. They include the Museum of Modern Art and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, France. I took three years of French in high school, and you saw me struggle. Just a lot. I think I did it all right. I think I did it all right. Maybe I'll, you know, you can see the. Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. So I, I'm welcoming Mr. John Dow. Peace, brother. How you feeling? I'm fine. And yourself? I I'm thank good. You for, I want to thank you for bringing me on for this wonderful, wonderful cause. We're here to support Philodanko, and Philodanko is so important. I'm from Philadelphia, and 
you know, young Myers Brown is just, he's given us so much enthusiasm and encouragement and, and drive. And, and she came through such a rough time, you know, dealing with uh, being black and she did it and she developed her people and it's just wonderful, wonderful. So I'm so happy to be a part of this fundraising effort for, to support her. And I think it's very, very important. No doubt, no doubt. Listen, I, I had the I had the queen on, the queen mother on last yes, week, and I saw, I saw, it. wonderful, yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. It, it was a privilege for me because I look at these as opportunities for for oral histories to be passed down, right? For us to to truly understand. As I, I told her last week, I said, "Listen, this is my first time interviewing somebody eighty plus, or just literally having a conversation." <laughs> Not even necessarily interviewing, having a conversation with somebody 80 plus. She said, what about your grandparents? I said, unfortunately, they transitioned when I was younger, right? But in my day to day, I don't necessarily get to have these type of healthy calm and fruitful and productive conversation with folk that, that look like you and I. So this is a, a, a treat for me. And I, I thank you for coming on. I, I thank, you know, my favorite Negro professional dancer, Zane Booker, for for, <laughs> for putting this together, for putting all of this together, man. It just shows the love that exists amongst black folk, no matter what the outside world say, right? We know within our community that love exists. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, so I know you mentioned, uh, you know, Joe Myers Brown and, and Philodenko. Is your first? Is this your first interaction with Phil, Philodenko, or have you, you know, supported them in any other uh, well, events well, or what have you? No, I, you know, I'm an artist in Philadelphia. You're aware of things going on. You get involved in your own projects, but uh, but I, I'm involved with Zane Booker right now in a second project. We did one project earlier that was done at the uh, Afro-American Museum at a show on, on cotton and we did, a, we did a dance piece. He did a piece and choreographed it with some ideas that I had that of course, you know, in Zane, he took over and you, you have to pull him, you got to pull the reins on him sometime, you know. But anyway, we, uh, we, had, a, we had a wonderful experience and did a, a, we did two performances at the Afro-American Museum and now we're working on another project that I'm doing. And so um, I have been aware of them and and through Zane and through Loves, I've gotten to know Joan Myers. And I've, you know, I, I've met her from time to time. She knows who I am. And I and I when I see her, you know, all you can do is go, you know, that's what you gotta do, because that's that's so important. But anyway, um, with the, with the interest in my work that I have is that I try to, at different times, I've gone for different projects. And uh, the biggest project recently is that uh, I had a, I did a project based on cotton, which came from dreams of my grandmother. And so uh, I started photographing cotton because I started dreaming of her and um, she just wouldn't go away. and. Uh, and my sister said, you're in trouble. Big mommy didn't play. So you better find out what she wants you to do and go get it done. And this thing came about cotton. And I was having a show in Savannah in, uh, at a telefair museum. And so while I was down there, I made contact with a farmer and I went and photographed some cotton. And that was the first time, that was in 2011. So I've been photographing cotton since then and it's been evolving from things of actually recording exactly what I saw and then taking what I saw and, and making images of it that relate to things like the first piece I told you I sent is uh, Spirits Rising. And it's, uh, it comes from the idea that of course,
no. stuff. And so it's, you know, it's, I, I, for me, it's all connected. It's all really connected and, uh, and important that we see our relationship to ourselves and stuff and to our past. Word, word. And so and what will happen is I'm going to end up bringing that, that, you know, that, that, you know, art piece of art up and, and we're going to discuss it again. Unfortunately, I had a, a brief audio problem as you was explaining. But the beautiful part is, again, I'm going to be bringing it up and you're going to be talking about it again. So it's, it's so, so, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Uh, and so for those of you who are um, who are watching, like, wait, what is he saying? What is he saying? Definitely going to bring it up because it's a it's it's a beautiful piece. And I was taken aback um, while viewing it. So, you know, just bear with us. We, we're good now to go on the audio component. And, and I appreciate you all. So I, I do want to ask you a question just about your start, right? I, I know you said you prior to us getting on in pre-production, you said, you know, I'm 80 years old, right? And so I, your start, where did, where did you get your start in, in, in the art world? In the art, art world, in art. Well, in, first in art, right? In the first in art, right? What, what prompted you to say, you know what, listen, this is something that I that I'm enjoying. This is something that I want to do because I talk a lot about this painting in the background and how the brother who who did it, he he pretty much shunned art until his mid twenties, right? Because he experienced trauma. He lost an eye. He had significant deaths in his family, and so it, especially amongst black black boys, right? Unless you're doing amazing artwork, you can't necessarily sit around and, and color in a coloring book, right? Because it's not masculine. Hold up, hold up, hold up. You didn't say where did I start, right? Uh, I had a black book copied on Lawrence Comics. And so I did that. And then in second grade, the second grade teacher said, we need somebody to write back backdrop. I said, do you have a picture of it? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I can do it. And so I did this big backdrop, you know? And um, they patted me on the back of my head. And I haven't been the same since, you know? So, so when you see it started with comic books and shit, it can start anywhere. And then in sixth grade, I started going to the school art league that uh, Fleischer Art Memorial, which is school art league they used to have and stuff. And that's really where I really started. That's when it's, the seeds really were were laid for me, you know, going into art, you know, so, and, it, and it's, it's, it's been back and forth that it's gone, you know, you, you go some, you back up some, and then you reevaluate and you, because I went off to be in sculpture, and then I, I uh, got to Tyler School of Art, and I didn't get along with the sculpture instructor, so I was in ceramics and printmaking, you know, I kept going and stuff, and I painted and do a lot of things since then, so, you know, you know. So, so was there any pressure to to stop? Whether it's external pressure, right? Because we think about peer influence. I, another friend of mine, he he was really into dance, but he grew up in the inner city of Chicago, and so participating in dance made him prime target for bullying, right? And so he he stopped. So was there any pre external pressures for you? Whether it's again this idea of masculinity or other brothers doing other things that had you like, hmm, maybe. I had a father who wanted me, he never forgave me for, for not being a doctor or a lawyer. You know, he he really, he, I mean, I had a major exhibition down at the Corkin Museum of Art down in uh, Washington, D.C. in 1971, and he was still upset that, you know, he said, oh, you would have been better if you'd have, if you had your, you know, you were a lawyer now with this, it would be really something, you know, and so, but hey, we all have our little things to work through and become aware of, which end up making us stronger and more committed to what we're going to do. So it's fine. Word, word. No, I, I think that's an amazing point. I, I think we're talking about that resilience piece that again, that's within all of us and this, this will to, to follow our path, right? We, again, we have so many, so many influences coming from so many directions. Everybody has our lives picked out for us. And it, it, and it takes for us to say, to be steadfast and say, 
this is what I want. It might not look pretty to everybody else. It might not look wonderful. I know you have ideas for me, but I have to be true to self because I won't forgive myself when I am 80 right, and right. reflecting on my life. Right, right. Absolutely. 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 Word. Absolutely. Word. So, Absolutely. I, I, go ahead. No, I'm no, just saying, I'm just saying like, like, I, I've been, I've been, I can say I've been I'm really blessed, you know, and uh, I'm very fortunate that, um, over the years, it's been amazing to me. I might not have a lot of money and a lot of this and that, but I've got to see my ideas realized. Like for, for example, in the eighties, I had this, I've been, I've been involved about music and getting structural ideas from music from really early on for me, because I listened to first James Brown and stuff in church music and then being involved in Coltrane and stuff and and I spent time with Archie Shep, you know, and and you know, getting little bits of info from Ornette and stuff. So it uh it's it's been, you know, very, you know, very strong for me. So I think that uh the the the, the important thing for me was figuring out a way how I understood what structure was and how I could proceed with an idea. And that idea can be whether I'm making a piece of sculpture or I'm doing painting, or in my case, I did concerts for 10 years using my artwork as scores for the performances. So I did that and people said, oh, you can't do that. Oh, you, you can't do that. And I ended up doing it, man, shit. I did a Museum of Modern Art in Paris, you know, and, and the Met in New York. And they say, well, you, you can't use your art with your scores. And, and so I did it. And that's what I mean. I've been fortunate enough to realize a lot of the dreams. And like, and, and working with Zane, I did a, this dance piece. And we're going to do another dance piece on based on Rittenhouse Square that's going to have sound, you know, with an orchestra and a bunch of other stuff. And... I feel fortunate that I, I get these ideas and they happen. And that's what's really important. No doubt, no doubt. Pushing the bounds, pushing the bounds of, <laughs> of what, seriously, man, because you, you, you see so many people say that things can't be done. I was never really one where people told me, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. I've never, yet, I haven't experienced that yet. But I, I feel comfortable in who I am to say I won't listen, right? Because I, I've seen what I've done already. And I and I know in this in the overarching scale of, of arena of white supremacy and all of that, I've I've already accomplished a lot. <laughs> you know what I mean? So so word word. So so question. So looking at the the current landscape of just art in general, and in black art specifically, and and this could be you know specifically to photography, painting, or this can just go into writing, or um, you know writing, just different art, different forms of art. What do you think the the state of of black art is today? Do you think it's in a good place? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I to me, I, I sort of get nervous when people say black art because it. To me, that's something somebody else said. We just do what we do. And we do what we do and express where we are and what our feelings are and things, the way sometimes it comes out, skewed, what I call to the left. That By that, I mean that it's uh, all uh, recognizable and stuff and you can see, or it's skewed to the right. And so we, we think about Ornette, you know what I mean? or or Morris Graves, or or Anthony Braxton, you know, and it's uh, and it's it's in the area they call the avant-garde or non-recognizable. You know what I mean? So in other words, you don't have a beat beat going all the time too. So and I think all of that gives us room to be whoever we are, and to me that's what's important to be whoever we are, and so. Um, I'm coming from areas about my own ancestral thing with my grandmother and doing other things, but I'm doing some other stuff also. So there's always room to move and to discover and being able to create, see the key to me is being able to create a really interesting piece or work that allows people to discover who they are 
and not who I am. That's my job to create something, a stimulus, so somebody can discover something about themselves, how they respond to a certain situation, how they deal with it one way or another. And I, I can't, all I can do is program or put together the aesthetic experience, but the outcome of that experience, I'm hoping to be something about their realization of who they are, you know. Does that make sense? It makes a ton of sense. No, no, no. Listen, that's that makes a ton of sense. It's, it's powful, right? We, you know, we we are curating these things and engaging in these things to for other people to learn about themselves. Again, I told you before getting on here that I was a therapist, right? And so, you know, I, I get in these rooms with with individuals that I work with, and I tell them I'm not here to to give you answers. Right. I'm here to, to help you pull out what's inside of you, the answers that you have. And it sounds like, you know, that at first, I, th- I think you're affirming that therapy is an art form. You know what I mean? So I, <laughs> so I can appreciate that. But but also just the, the, the work of the artist and, you know, the, the meaning for them versus the meaning for others and how it's meant to be thought provoking and, and have people be truly introspective. Right, right. Absolutely. 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 But at the same same time, time, I'm still trying to to put together what I call that picture. You look at it and you go, oh my God, oosh. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, You know, that that's putting you, you get the color right, the space right, the moment the touch right, and that's that's the thing too, you know. Again, we got to have goals, right? (laughs) We, We That, that that keeps us up, you know. This, this gives this allows us to get up another day and to continue to work if we have something to strive for, for sure, for sure. Before we get into your artwork, I, and this was my first time seeing this title, I saw Professor Emer- Emeritus, uh, you know, in other spaces. Um, but what exactly is Professor Emeritus of printmaking? What do, what does that entail? <laughs> I survived, I survived 42, 42 years, years of teaching, teaching at Chelsea University. University. I got, I got it all alive. Alive. And they said, and they said well, well, you know, you can get an emeriti, you know, uh, uh, classification, which means I get a parking spot. <laughs> 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 and, a and a lot of work like hard to keep these years. Word, word. How, but how was that experience teaching at, at Temple for, for 42 years? I, I, again, you've, again, that spans generations, right? Not, yeah, not yeah. too many generations. I, I wanted to do that to you, but it definitely no, spans no, a generation no, or two. No, the no, thing no. is, is that, you know, um, it, it, it was good for me. It provided me a foundation. I can continue my work and have to worry about eating. Uh, I was around, you know, you had a couple, you have, you have students that are stimulating and you stim- stimulate them. You know, is exchange back and forth, and that's a very good situation. And at the same time, you know, it had to be, you know, let's not kid ourselves. Being black in a white institution is still you're still black in a white institution, and some of the things that you put up didn't go, and certain things would have gone. We know, and you know, you say, you just move on and do things. But that's the way it really was. And so, um, no, I was fortunate. I I did my time, and I you know. When I left, I was ready to go. You know, I'm ready to get the freedom to get get out here and do my own work, do my thing. Yeah, you know. Word and 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 you know, people see me talk about it all the time. Being black at a at a PWI, predominantly white institution, it's it's not for the faint of heart, right? And I'm on both sides as a student and as an adjunct professor. And the adjunct professor is like the yeah. yeah. And we're, at, we're at the bottom. Exactly. 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 So I'm glad that you you said it because that again that affirms a lot of, of what I speak to. So so what are we going to get into now is and, and people are being going to be able to see it on their screen. We're going to get into your amazing art pieces that will be at the the virtual auction being held uh, by Philadelphia again. You uh, it's, 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 excuse me, it's not, not so not much so an auction, it's, it's a sale. sale. The people are going to work, 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 work,
and half and of, half uh, of uh, 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 the, the purchase will be tax deductible tax because, that because that was going, going to Philadelphia. Word, word. So, and, and you're supporting both the artist and Philadelphia. Absolutely. 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 For sure, for sure. And, and so the first piece that we have, which you did talk about earlier, um, what it was spirits right, rising. Right. And so the people are able to see that on the screen right now. So can you talk a, bit, a little bit about spirit rising? Well, well uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the idea for spirit rising, spirit rising came, came from, from reading, reading about... about that some of the slaves unfortunately died, died. They, 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 they would work the death in that field. And, uh, and, uh, and many, many times, times the strangers, the strangers was, they, were they were being pushed, pushed so hard that, that they didn't, they didn't allow, allow, you know, you know the slaves around them to stop and to bury someone and pull someone off. They had to keep working and it had to come back in the evening. And so that's why I did this period that, well, they did that and they died, but their spirits were rising. And so I created this piece that is my idea about that. So that's, you see the cotton field there and you see the things, the motions going up in the, uh, in the sky and stuff, doing a thing with it. And I'm using images of the cotton to sort of, you know, to give ideas about their spirits and stuff. And so that's what that particular piece is about, so, you know. And the way I make my photographs is that I shoot a lot of different images, some close up, some far away and things together. And working with my assistant, I take and a collage, visually collage some of these different elements together in order to create the feeling. That's why I tell people a lot of times, I'm not a photographer, I'm an artist with a camera because I'm shooting and I'm taking what's there and I'm altering it and putting it together to come up with other things. Word. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful work. Well, again, this is the first one I opened up and it just, I, again, I was taken aback, right? I, you know, I'm like, Kai, and I was expecting Kai because I, you know, I'm reading your bio, but then I'm just like, how powerful this, this imagery is. You know, I thought about like, hey, is this in my budget, right? Again, I told you, I'm an adjunct professor, so I can't guarantee. <laughs> We have time payment plans. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I pay, but if I can put it on layaway, then it might be a go. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. So we're going to trans. Yes, we've transitioned to the second piece, which is sending the message. Yeah, so can you explain about this? Yeah, well, this is. Um, uh, this is the Wall Street Trinity Church. In, uh, in New York that was in existence uh, and was helped built by, by slaves. And um, they would go in and out of, sometimes they would bury, allow people of color to be buried in their uh, cemeteries and sometimes they would not. And uh, I, um, uh, I was in New York and I wanted to photograph and they wouldn't let me photograph. And I kept sending the emails, I mean, you know, and I had people in the fiscal church sending emails and nobody answered. And then, you know, of course, the, the brothers come up with the ways that we can solve the way to make the photograph anyway. What it is, they wouldn't let me have a tripod. Inside the shoot, you have to be, it's a very slow exposure. So you can't handhold. So you have to do something to attach the camera to. I did that. And so then when I was working, I said, I really wanted to make this picture and said, I did send them a message that like, you know, we are cool, you know, and that, um, and that we should have been buried with everybody else and just in the whole thing. So I said, I did this whole image about sending them the message that God says that, you know, we black folk are just as wonderful as everybody else. So that's how I put that picture together. I mean, that's the idea behind it. Technically, there's a whole bunch of, that's a goodie technically to put that one together <laughs> but we did it <laughs> yeah. yeah it's 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 so complex it's you know again i wouldn't even know where to to begin in in describing it again the people are watching and looking at it it's just it, it's so detailed right and and as what you talked about earlier like it evokes emotion whether i knew what it was or you know the the impetus behind it or not just looking right, at right. it and viewing it, it makes me feel something. Right. 
that's my goal. That's my goal. Yeah. Word. So we're going to go to the next picture. The next, the next one is, one is, 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 uh, is, is the 33 30 station. I, I, before I started photographing, you know, cotton and crops and things, and uh, because I've also photographed corn too. But uh, anyway, um, I, um, I photographed a lot cityscapes and up. I like to go up and look down. And I was always interested in the idea of, of trying to put together the inside and the outside. And so this was this one particular case. I was up at the top in, um, in the Third Street Station where I had a light reflecting from over my shoulder. So the light reflecting on the glass and I'm shooting through the glass. So you look at it, it looks like you, you have this putting together of the outside and the inside at the same time in the space. So that's really what that one's really about. And it's, uh, yeah, that, 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 that's a goodie. That, that, that really, it's very different. I mean, I've done it before in other situations, but that's, the, the, as we would say down the way, that's a smoker. <laughs> agreed, agreed. Question. So, like, again, when you get this inspiration, it was you, were you in 30th Street Station? It was just like, hey, you know what? This would be an amazing picture. Or did, did you wake up? Excuse me. Excuse me. I took almost four months of emails and things to get permission to photograph. When I was up there photographing, the woman was with me. The police came running. And she stopped him because no brother was supposed to be up there. Okay. So it, it was a lot of times when I photograph from places, it's just not that simple. I mean, I was in Atlanta. I almost went to jail two or three times in Atlanta from photographing from a parking lot because they said, well, you didn't get permission. I said, well, here's my ticket to get into the parking lot. You know what I mean? And stuff. And I got a camera, look at the camera. I mean, I'm not, I was shooting with a four by five then. So I'm, honestly, I'm not bothering anyone, but you know how that is anyway. <laughs> we we do, and I think that's it. <laughs> no, I, I do, and I think I appreciate you for letting folk know, like this is, you know, these are the types of experiences that, you know, we in particular often are up against, whether it's something yeah. as, you know, some people might be, is the way I said it, right? It's just as simple as going in 30th Street and taking some pictures, right? <laughs> but no, it's it's much more complex than that. And there's so many added layers um, that come from and that are behind some of the art that we do see and engage with. Again, no different. And, and, and I think it's easier when it's a book, right? And people are able to, they're writing about their memoir and their experiences that got them to where they are. But with the picture, with artwork, you know, we're just looking at it, right? We don't recognize all that went into that, the stress, the tr that's traumatizing. If I got police running up to me and I'm a black man, right, in society, that's true. Uh, that could be a traumatic experience. And so yes, yes. It's, it's heavy, it's heavy. Yeah, yeah. Word. So we're going to transition now to the next uh, piece of art, which is Through the Branches. Yeah, this is a photograph that was taken uh, of, uh, in uh, Rittenhouse Square. And uh, I've, been, I've been working on Rittenhouse Square on and off for about five years. And um, I... I've sort of discovered me a perch I mean, because normally I don't take photographs of people and walk up and say, can I take your photograph? Because I do that, the photograph's nothing to that. So I find places where I can shoot where people don't see me. So at 1825 Walnut is a parking lot. I'm five stories up in the air and I'm shooting. And so I can shoot with a big lens or a stronger lens. And I can, you know, technically speaking, I can do a lot of things, but that's one whereby, uh, because when you go photographing through like branches and stuff like that, you're usually out of focus because it's difficult to focus through. But, uh, but I know how to do it. Anyway, this is, uh, 
This is a photograph is up, and if you look carefully, there was a woman there in this red dress. And I ran, I was coming up there, I got out of my car, and I said, oh my God, look at that woman in that red dress. And I was just running to get my equipment set up before she moved, you know, and I said, ah, I got her, I got her, I got her. This bad sister boy, really, I can tell you, yeah. So how often are you are you doing that where it's just like it 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 seems perfect but you're not set up yet. And so it's like, okay, you know what? I gotta get to this quick before I miss this moment. Yeah, well, you you do miss some moments, then you sit and wait for others and you move and you do back and forth. I've done a lot of shooting in Rittenhouse Square where I shoot with with a, with a larger lens so I can shoot someone a half a block away and they aren't aware that I'm photographing them and stuff like that up close, you know? And so it, it depends on the situation. I've been in my spirit things that I've been putting together for Rittenhouse Square. I've been doing a lot of shooting at night where I shoot and I shoot up in the trees and stuff. And then I put things together because I'm making images. I'm collaging these images together to make a thing. Yeah, you know, you know. Word, word. Again, beautiful piece, beautiful piece. And and last but not, certainly not least, we have Transition. And so yeah, yeah. can you speak a little bit about Transition is a watercolor. And uh, I mentioned to you earlier that, uh, well, it was uh, around in the 80s and things that I was doing these concerts using my artwork as scores for music. And this is one of the pieces that we used, or pieces like this was used, you know, as a particular score. And, and the idea is uh, there are ideas about sound and a tra transition of sounds. If you, this was done in particular for uh, a guy named Neil, who was a bass player, you know, and uh, and I put that together as the idea that. He'd be playing up and down on his bass, you know, making sounds and stuff and things with. And so it was, um, that's how I put it, attempted to put it together structurally. But if you look at the colors, the colors, you know, intensify and drop off. And, uh, and that's how the idea is like really put together. And so, you know, that, so I really wanted to show that, uh, that one in particular, because that's one of the ones that's going to be in um, in the exhibition. You know, all of these pieces are going to be in the virtual exhibition. But you know, on the on the twenty seventh, there's going to be in West Philadelphia. There's going to be uh, uh, this reception and things on it, and some of the actual pieces will be there. And it's one of the pieces that's going to be there. You know, so. Yeah, well, again, hopefully, you know, layaway works because, I, you know, I, I have my eye on, on several. Again, they're, they're beautiful pieces, um, beautiful works of art. I think the, the the story behind it even adds more value, right? It adds more value because then you can talk about it when, you know, say I did purchase one. You can go so you know what? And, and the white folk, them cops, they was, you know, and that's why we need to defund the police, right? So we could have a, a full conversation just stemming uh, from this artwork. Listen, it's, it's, it's beautiful and so breathtaking. So my final question before I let you get out of here, and I appreciate you taking the time. Um, outside, of, outside of acquiring a, a piece of art, what would you like individuals to to get out of just this this um this this benefit well, right the one, one thing, well the, well, the, the one, one thing, thing is, is to come and i think and many times we miss things by becoming aware of who we really are and how we got to where we are and i think they need to come and really pay homage to Joan Meyer Brown. That's what I'm hoping. And I'm hoping if anything, as someone can look at the work, if they, if they can't buy it and stuff, that's okay. But maybe I've encouraged them to go to another museum, another gallery and look at another piece again, or go look at another piece again. The same way at times 
you know, when you hear when you hear music, you hear some, and sometimes you're not that used to it. I mean, I think of the first time I heard Ornan Coleman when I was 18 years old, you know, and I said, oh my God, that guy's making noise. And then, then after a while, I said, aha, uh -huh. so I got to understand that, you know, and, uh, and in that case, I was very fortunate to, to meet him and talk to him and we talk structural ideas with him, you know, and stuff. And so I think that's the thing to open, open the pathway to really who and what and what we're capable of being and becoming. I think if anything, that's that's the ultimate goal, but that's what Joan wants to do. She wants to show you about the movement. She wants to show you about the images, the possibility, you know, and the things. And, and that's what's so truly important, you know? Agreed, agreed. And, and this is truly, I think my generation and, and, and younger, there's this idea of generational wealth and it being monetary, right? It's about the cash exactly. dollar, but you know, but we talk about true generational wealth. We're talking about these art pieces that, that are passed down from generations, these conversations that are passed down from, through generations. Joan Myers Brown taking time to talk to, to have a conversation with me. That's the true generational wealth. And that's what, you know, this experience, um, this virtual benefit, partnering some amazing artists uh, with Philodenko, this is exactly what you'll get. This is the generational wealth you'll be able to have uh, conversations with folk about. You know, when I'm in New York and this is, you know, 50 years from now and I'm having a conversation with my daughter, with my son, like, I had a conversation with this brother on, on the YouTubes, right? I had a conversation, go, go check him out, right? Go check him out because it's, it's an amazing thing and I... You know, I'm, I'm blessed to have you and being able to be in conversation with you. So I, I thank you, uh, Mr. John E. Dow Jr. That's what I'm going to hit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. You know, you know. For sure. Yeah, yes. And I, and I want to thank those of you who are tuned in on both the Facebooks and on YouTube. As always, hit the subscribe button. And if you do want to participate in the virtual benefit taking place, it opens June 27th online. You can go to philodankoartgallery.com. Or if you're interested in just learning about uh, Philodanko, go to philodanko.org. Uh, and lastly, there is a, a, a special afternoon lunch 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 i'm hungry launch party occurring on june 27 from 12 p.m to 3 p.m at 5019 baltimore avenue philadelphia pa again it's featuring an art exhibition by this amazing brother right here john dow and live music by by kingsley abeniche um donation is forty dollars and the tickets are available at philodanko.org zane i know you're watching I need two tickets, black man. You're my favorite Negro dancer, so I'm expecting two tickets. <laughs> right? Expecting the two tickets. Again, I thank everybody for tuning in, and I will catch up with you when I see you. Peace.